Have a good morning. <clears throat> uh, many smaller colleges and universities are at a serious disadvantage when it comes to implementing technology to create a blended learning environment. Um, without big technology budgets and manpower of larger and more generously endowed institutions, the faculty at smaller colleges often face <clears throat> an uphill battle to find ways to use technology in the classroom. Adding to this mix a student population that is drawn largely from the designation of urban learners, um, defined as largely inner city, minority, and first generation college students, and the picture becomes even more complicated. Um, such situation exists at my institution, Trinity Washington University, where I've been a professor of art history for more than 25 years. And that's Trinity. Um, the story that I have to tell here is not about how we do incredible things with limited resources, but instead how making a very small change in what you do can increase student learning outcomes. Um, in my case, that change came when I decided to close the book. Um, and shift from using textbooks to using online materials those who create my own textbooks. Um, for years, I've gone to presentations where people talk about the wonderful things they do teaching with art history. Um, they talk about integrating GIS technology into their classrooms to map objects along the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela, mapping the art um, dealers in 19th century London, all different kinds of cool projects. Um, and these are clearly fabulous learning tools, and I'd like to learn about them myself, but the fact of the matter is they are absolutely unfeasible at a place like Trinity. We don't have a GIS lab, we don't have any site licenses for gaming software, I have no graduate assistance, and an extremely limited IT staff. As a matter of fact, there's three for the entire college. Um, when questioned, um, faculty at these institutions have created these things not be, either because they have an abundance of technological expertise or they have access to huge IT staff and a lot of tech sem grad students. Um, again, this isn't an option at Trinity. Um, what I begin, begin to discover that there are a lot of resources that you can use free of charge on the web that help the students um, in really unimaginable ways. And for me, the free of charge angle also became an important consideration in the decision to start using mostly digital resources in my classes. Um, to understand the reason for getting rid of textbooks in the context of Trinity, um, you need to know something about the institution. Um, Trinity is the oldest Catholic women's college in the United States, founded in 1897 by the sisters of Notre Dame de, de Mure. And here you see two historic photographs of Trinity. The one on the top is from 1905. The other one is from an ancient uh, um, sort of or ceremony that they used to have called the Daisy Chain in 1922. Um, Trinity was once the college of choice for the daughters of middle class Catholic families from the nor Northeast. And our distinguished alumna include people like Nancy Pelosi, the first female speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, and also uh, Jane uh, Damon McAuliffe, who is a former president of our host institution, Bryn Mawr, and is going to be our conference, our commencement speaker on Saturday. Um, at its peak in 1968, Trinity served a student population of about 1,000 women. However, 1968 was also the year when our neighboring institution, Georgetown University, went co-ed. And the fact that many of these institutions really sort of dealt a death knell to a lot of women's college. Um, according to the Women's College Coalition, in 1960 there were 230 women's colleges, but by 2014 in the U.S. and Canada there were only 47. Um, at Trinity, initiative, initiatives such as the founding of a weekend college, which is co-ed, um, in the 1980s kind of helped the college to stay alive. But when I first arrived in the late 1980s, there were only about 300 full-time undergraduates enrolled in the college, um, which is clearly not a sustainable number. Um, however, Trinity survived by reinventing um, the institution. This is another historic photo here. Um, the original founders of the college, uh, Sister Julia McGrady and Sister Mary Euphrasia, fought to establish the institution even going so far as to hunt down the Archbishop of Washington when he was on vacation, traveling from DC to Atlantic City, New Jersey, wearing the very standard heavy woolen robes worn by sisters of the 19th century in the August heat and humidity. 
um, they impressed the archbishop and who supported their cause and Trinity was established to serve the underserved and in this case women. Um, in the 1990s, Trinity reinvented itself with our president Patricia McGuire at the helm who is an equally determined woman. Uh, Trinity began to focus its attention on once again serving the underserved but this time with an emphasis on minority women and here is our president with some of our students. Um, today, Trinity is a thriving institution with a student population of more than 2,200 scattered across five schools. Um, and on June the 4th, we are going to actually celebrate the opening of a new academic center, which is the first academic building built on campus in 35 years. And this is the new building and the woman standing there over the school seal in the middle of the new building is our famous history professor, um, also one of our nuns, resident nuns, and the college archivist. Um, we do accept men in some programs, but in the core liberal arts program of the college, um, our population is still only women, and today we have about a thousand students in that program, so approximately the same as we had in 1968. Um, this is a situation of students today and <laughs> yesterday. Um, basically, staying true to the original mission, Trinity went, underwent what we refer to as a paradigm shift. Um, our student body now largely consists of African American and Latina women, many of whom face financial difficulties to come to college. Um, the journey of Trinity in this respect was actually profiled in a film that was done by the Chronicle of Higher Education in March of 2015, and this paints a very vivid picture of the difference in our student body today. As the film points out, 90% of our students are African American or Latina. 70% of our students are eligible for Pell Grants, um, which if you're not familiar with that, is a government program to provide money to low-income students. Um, typically, people who receive the most money from Pell have a family income of under $20,000 a year. Um, the median family income for a full-time Trinity student is $25,000, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, we also have significant situation with other kinds of students that come here. This is a picture that was just taken a couple of weeks ago at the launch of the literary magazine at Trinity. Um, and one of the students in here is actually um, from a program called the Dreamer Scholars, which is a scholarship that's given to students who, although they were born in the United States, their parents are undocumented alien, which means that they have absolutely no access to financial aid at all. Um, and the student in this picture who's in this, I have had the privilege to teach, and I have to say she's one of the most brilliant students I have ever taught in my entire life, and she would have never been able to go to college if it hadn't been for that program. Um, needless to say, these rather dramatic shifts have necessitated a rethinking about teaching and learning. Um, in art history, this has been a particular problem. Uh, financially challenged students tend to come from struggling high schools and backgrounds, and the lack of cultural literacy is a really significant factor. Um, it's a sad fact that the vast majority of Trinity students are from the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, and they've never set foot in a local museum, despite the fact that nearly everything in Washington, D.C. is free of charge. Um, it was a shock to me to discover that many local school districts don't even organize field trips to such places. Um, as a parent myself, I chaperoned many such trips for my own children, and on an even more personal note, I actually grew up in Washington, D.C., and I have very vivid memories of sitting cross-legged in front of Renoir's luncheon of the boating party at the Phillips Collection, and you see a slide of this, on an elementary school field trip, and I think that's why I became an art historian. Um, while many students have very limited access to art history prior to college, because it tends to be a specialized AP course, a lot of K-12 students have exposure to great works of art through other means. Um, they're often used as illustrations in classes, they're you know, used in you know, history, English, different kinds of things. Um, unfortunately, when they walk through the door, most Trinity students are more likely to think of names like Michelangelo and Leonardo as crime-fighting, pizza-eating, teenage mutant ninja turtles rather than masters of Renaissance art. So during the past two decades, the change in our student population has given me a lot to think about in teaching art history. Um, the, we do not have a major, and the number of students who, we do have a number of students who minor in fine arts, but most of our classes 
function as part of the general education curriculum. Um, initially, I was starting to ask to think about what students should learn. But ultimately, I became aware that it was not just what students should learn, but how students have to learn about the fine arts. I've done a lot of experimenting, but by far the most successful thing that I've done to date was to get rid of textbooks um, and to move to using online digital materials. Um, initially, I was motivated to do this by two factors, um, cost and volume of material. Um, obviously, cost is a significant factor for the Trinity students. So a number of years ago, faced with students who were failing in mastering the material, I passed out an anonymous survey with one simple question. Did you purchase the textbook? Um, I was disappointed, but not surprised, when about 80% of the students said that no, they hadn't bothered to buy the, tech, the book. To put this in perspective, the current list price as of the other day um, on the Pearson Higher Education website for Stokestad's Art History, which is one of the main survey texts, um, was $239.07, um, which is a significant amount of money for any student. Obviously, used books, online sellers such as Amazon and rental texts provide a more reasonable price point for these texts, but they also require access to online sellers and credit cards, which our students don't have. Uh, many Trinity students receive vouchers as part of their financial aid packages, which can only be redeemed at the Trinity bookstore. So even when providing used books, the prices of the actual bookstore tends to be significantly higher than using online sellers, to which they have no access. Um, this question of access to textbooks um, becomes a significant stumbling block for financially challenged students. Um, another issue, quite frankly, is the breadth of the textbook themselves. Uh, the discipline of art history has evolved, evolved to become more inclusive, which is in many respects a great thing. But in the real world, Teaching students with limited cultural literacy means paring down to basics and creating understanding rather than increasing breadth. Um, several years ago, I sat in a focus group at one of the main, for one of the main survey textbooks at a conference where the author of the book, who works at a very different kind of an institution than Trinity, stated that his motivation for expanding the textbook was that his students constantly wanted more. Well, half the room agreed with him. The other half, including myself, complained that this was too much for our students. Textbooks publishers haven't listened to us. Um, an example of this is the average size of one of the textbook, and it's really grown. Um, when I was an undergraduate a long time ago, uh, the main textbook that I used was about the size of what you see today as a brief history or a basic history of this. Um, and those, now the textbooks are about double in size with this emphasis to try to put more inclusive material in it. And I found that the sheer volume of totally unfamiliar material is extremely intimidating to the students. Even using the basic textbook, which I did for a while, caused the students to fret over the vast number of illustrations, even though they weren't asked to be memorize every picture in the book. Um, so. I really began to consider ditching the textbook when I attended a that camp, um, which was done in association with the College Art Association uh, in February of 2013. Um, one of the sessions was actually led by Dr. Nancy Ross, who's an assistant professor of art history at Dixie State University in Utah. And she offered a kind of simple but really insightful concept, and that was put a bunch of art historians in a room with different people have different specializations and in 90 minutes come up with an online textbook and it was a very very educational experience to go through that um, basically because what we discovered was some areas were pretty well populated and some areas were not populated at all um, and so this show you know show that it was very difficult for people to actually do this and of course if you don't have the specialization in some areas when you're trying to put this together for a survey class you don't exactly know where to look so it became very difficult for her to do this but it was a really fascinating um, actual okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> fascinating experience uh, to actually do that Um, discussions with Dr. Ross were kind of interesting for me too because even though she teaches at a 
place with a very different student demographic, a lot of the challenges that her students faced were the same from what I was facing at Trinity. So stoked by this experience, I did not order textbooks for my art survey class the following academic year. Instead, I decided to create my own textbook using online materials and Moodle, our course management system. Um, I was very fortunate that in art history, it wasn't too terribly difficult to create at least a basic framework because of the existence of this particular website called Smart History. Um, and Smart History is a very interesting project uh, it, the aim of it is to actually create a free, open access history of art that is illustrated with high quality digital images. Um, it began mainly as recorded conversations between the two founders of the site, Dr. Beth Harris and Dr. Stephen Zucker, um, and they talk about the paintings. Um, it has been expanded dramatically to actually include written text um, for uh, most of the objects. Uh, it also has access to the best digital materials in terms of reproductions that are available, information about things like materials and techniques, a glossary, um, and pretty much anything that a textbook could provide and more. For example, in a textbook, if you want to try and explain to somebody about lost wax casting, it's a very difficult concept for students to grasp. But if you can watch a video about how they do it, it makes it a lot easier to understand what's actually going on. Um, the other thing about Smart History, it provides a very wide variety of specializations and the viewpoints of over 200 scholars, including myself, um, who've contributed content to the actual site. Um, unfortunately, when I started this project, Smart History was less complete than it is today, so I had to reach out to a lot of other sites that were maintained by museums and organizations to fill in the information that was lacking. So I unveiled this new concept in my ancient to medieval survey with some trepidation. I was unsure how students would respond. Um, there were a few students who told me that they couldn't manage this way and they needed a textbook and I gave them you know, the option to buy one. But by and large, the situation has been so successful that I've now pretty much retired the textbook in all of my classes. Um, the question here is why do I consider using the online material such an important learning tool? Now obviously the practical consideration is cost because it creates no financial drain on Trinity's students. Um, another practical consideration for me is that our Moodle system actually allows me to track student activity um, so that I can actually check on whether or not students clicked on the assignments. And although this may seem a bit big brotherish, um, it allows me to check on students, particularly those who are performing poorly in the class, when they come and sit in my office and say, I don't know how to study for this class, and I can go back and look and say, well, if you did some of the reading, it might help a lot. Um, and so this is a, a good issue for me with the traditional text. I don't know if they open it. I don't know if they use it as a doorstop. I don't know if they actually purchase it. So for me, this is a really added bonus. Um, given the fact that many of our students come from underperforming educational backgrounds, sometimes we need to teach the students how to learn and that it's necessary to do certain things in order to learn and this has proved to be very beneficial for me in um, assessing my classes. Uh, the other idea which is very important um, is looking at how students learn in this movement to online text. Um, again, um, it's a question of trying to ascertain exactly what skills students are lacking and trying to make up in these areas. Um, several years ago, Trinity actually included a critical reading course in our general education curriculum, noting that many of the students have problems with understanding, analyzing text. Um, many of the art books are written in kind of a traditional language that most, I think maybe all students, um, potentially find confusing and incomprehensible. Um, to give an example of that, um, the discussions of this particular painting, which is by um, an artist named William Holman Hunt, is called The Awakening Conscious. It was painted in uh, 1853. Um, this is showing you the painting and then just the little page on smart history. Um, in the Jansen Basic textbook, they talk about this picture. They give it a paragraph. Um, and they talk about the work of the artist, and this is a quote, characterized by a combination of Victorian moral didacticism and intense naturalism. Um, this is something that our students definitely have no clue what they're talking about. 
He goes on as well, the author, to talk about, and this is again a quote, the density of objects and figures in the painting, which eliminates the compositional pattering and pleasing contours that the PRB disliked. Now, I'm a Victorian specialist, and I'm not quite clear what he means by that. And that would not be something that I would write, and I did write, actually write the text that goes along with this here. And it isn't anywhere in here, nor is it anywhere in the recorded conversation between Dr. Harris and Dr. Zucker that goes along with this. Um, smart history, uh, just as a contrast, it's written in a much more general language. Um, and as a contributor myself, I can attest to the fact that it is extremely difficult to balance the need for substantive information with a readable and accessible style that the average person can actually understand. Um, the Awakening Conscience entry on smart history um, contains basic information about the painting in both written and in audio formats. It also contains hyperlinks to other articles that explain certain concepts. Um, and if you go down, it contains as well little details of the picture, its relation to some other Victorian paintings at the time, and at the bottom of it, it has a series of things that you can click on to give you more information about that particular painting. So you have a situation that allows not only the students to learn about the, the interest, the work itself, but it also gives them the opportunity to follow up on it. So if there's something that particularly grabs their attention, they have a mechanism for moving through um, the material. Um, now, I use this example not because I think that I'm a much better author than the guy who wrote the Janssen survey text, um, but to point out that it's important that we start trying to make some of these materials more accessible to students to ensure um, that their learning outcomes are achieved. Um, more important in the switch to online resources is the increase in cultural literacy and the improved outcomes that have resulted from the switch. Um, I believe many teachers like online material because it makes certain things more alive to the students. Um, instead of looking at piles of marble columns and broken statues and trying to imagine a Greek temple, um, current online projects reconstruct such places um, and allow the students to actually see them. Uh, more importantly, the online resources allow students to watch things more than once. Um, if you post it, if you show it in class and the students watch it, then you know that's it. Um, if you post it on Moodle, the students can watch it multiple times until they understand a concept. A curious student can use this uh, to their advantage. Um, so the students here, again, it helps them to be taught how to learn, what kind of materials they need, and allows them to take some ownership um, of actually learning. Uh, I probably wouldn't have tried this um, had I not gone to some of these technology things. Um, and it's been interesting because the students in Survey 1 particularly uh, report that they um, enjoy watching the reconstructions and other materials. Um, it's also important, again, for Trinity students because they have not had the opportunity to travel and to see other places. Many of them have never left DC. Um, and so, and they don't understand why DC looks like a temple. You know, they don't understand the motivation behind the architecture of it. So the fact that these students don't have this kind of access, having them fly through a 3D construction of ancient Rome, which is, this is, um, done this, there's an ancient Roman project that's been done, um, but again, it was a big budget thing, it was like a $100 million budget price tag to create the models here. But allowing them to do this, it's not exactly um, a replacement for a trip to Italy, but it's you know better than they can get by looking at all of the columns lying on the ground. Um, in the time that I've used the online resources, um, I've also been able to document a number of impacts on my classes. Um, firstly, there's an increased rate in inter returning students. Since we don't have um, a major program, most of the students come in, they take one course, and then they disappear um, to satisfy their gen ed requirement. But we have always have had a number of students who would decide they really liked it, they come back, they take more than one class, sometimes they decide to minor um, in the subject. Um, I keep statistics on returning students in the program, uh, and in the past few years since I started doing this, the number of returning students has more than doubled, which I, you know, I think this is not just because I'm an amazing professor, um, but I know from talking to students that they, A, really like being introduced to a subject they didn't know about, and B, they really like being able to explore it in their own time outside of class, 
and those that are interested really do take advantage of that ability. Um, because the online materials have a much higher rate of interactivity, this has proved a lot more intriguing to the students. Uh, the second way that I can document the impact of online resources is improved test scores. Uh, there tends to be a learning curve for most students in an art history class. Uh, mostly they do pretty poorly on the first exam uh, and then they figure out what's expected and what they need to learn and effective personal study techniques and things improve. Um, this is still certainly the case, but the average scores on exams have definitely increased. Um, I did a statistical analysis of the couple of years before I started doing this and the grade curves versus the couple of years since I've been doing this in the survey classes. Um, in survey one, I generally give five exams during a semester. Um, and the first exam, the scores have increased by about five points. But by the time we get to the fifth exam, the scores have increased by about 15 points, which is a significant, you know, um, issue for the students here. Um, this means that they are achieving higher grades in our history classes, which also probably makes them more likely to come back. Um, but it also gives them a confidence in mastering a subject that at the beginning is almost completely alien to them. <laughs> uh, and that's very useful. Um, students' evaluations also have told me that they like the online material and they find them very helpful in studying for the class. Uh, I went back and looked at a bunch of the old course evaluations too, and there are a lot of complaints about the book. Um, and I don't have any complaints about the book since I the books since I actually changed to using the online material. Um, now, this is obviously a admittedly unscientific look at using online resources to replace textbooks, textbooks at one particular institution. Um, I only have personal data in this and that's of course not exhaustive. Um, it's a typical Trinity story, trying to figure out how to teach with a limited budget facilities and materials. As our president frequently tells the faculty, it's part of our tradition to be poor. Um, it's also part of our tradition to work with students who are typically excluded from higher education. And Trinity's resources is kind of a testament to the many strong women who've sustained the college for over a century now. Um, in the 21st century, we face new educational issues, many of which will be solved by groundbreaking changes. And I'm being very things here. This is um, a picture from the 1960s for the groundbreaking of uh, one of the dormitories at Trinity. Uh, and this is our then president, Sister Margaret Clayton, who's now in her 90s and when I first came there was an extraordinary professor, professor of English literature. Um, but the issue here is that all these changes that we need to make, can there, some of them are really big groundbreaking changes. Other ones are small tweaks uh, in the way that we use our existing technology and our teaching methodologies. So what I would really like to provoke um, in some of these technology um, forums uh, is a discussion of how a small budget, less technologically innovative institution can make a positive change by some use of technology in the classroom. Um, the concept of blended learning really implies online courses and the implementation of technology to stimulate new ideas in learning. And when I said to somebody that I know that I was going to a blended learning conference, they looked at me like I'd lost my mind because they said, you don't do online classes. Uh, and I said, no, that's not exactly what we're doing here. Um, a lot of these you know, very high budget, very high technological ideas are really wonderful but it does disadvantage a certain segment of the student population. And the case that I know the best is this issue of the urban learner. Um, with the push that we have today to expand access to higher education to many who would never have been able to achieve a college degree in the past, we must really adapt our teaching style and use technology to reach this ever expanding student base. We tend to think of our current students as digital natives um, but the truth is that student populations that come from an overwhelmed and underfunded high school um, frequently lack some of the skills that make it easy for better prepared students to excel in this brave new technological world. And what I keep hearing here is that the whole idea of the digital native isn't as much as we thought it was or what the literature would actually have you believe. So closing the book in my classes was a pretty small change. Um, however, for my students at Trinity, 
um, I believe this was a huge leap. Um, it's opened the eyes of many students uh, to the wonders of art and history in a way that was unimaginable even a few years ago. Um, it invokes the intention of blended learning to open new avenues for students. And what I'd like to suggest is that it's time for a discussion that focuses not just on all the cool things that an institution can do with an unlimited budget and a large IT staff, but for academics like myself, what you can do on your own. And I am not tech savvy in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I have tried to do this to provide some new technological skills and experience for the students. Um, the availability of all this new technology provides us with both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, as educators, we need to think realistically about the needs of our students and how we can adapt to changing student populations and how we can improve the quality of instruction going forward. Um, in the words of one of Trinity's founders, Sister Julia McGrady, for the sake of the work, we must not fail.